Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone here. Um, I am always glad to uh, violate the fire code. <laughs> Must be doing something right. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank the center. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Trisha Rose, Christina Downs, Caitlin Murphy, and especially Jordan Camp. Let's give him a round of applause. Please. <clears throat> and um, I'd like to dedicate my reading this afternoon to the memory of the late Michael Harper, a um, great African-American poet uh, who taught here for many years and who passed away recently. And if you don't know his work, you really should. So this is for Michael Harper. <clears throat> um, this afternoon, I want to give you a poet's point of view on race, ethnicity, and social change. And the role of poets in particular and artists in general in social movements in the making of social change. I'll be reading today from this book, Viva to Those Who Have Failed. That will be followed by a Q&A, and that in turn will be followed by a book signing at the room at the front of the uh, building. Um, <clears throat> but let's begin with uh, an antidote to historical amnesia. We've heard a great deal in this election cycle about immigrants and immigration. And so let us begin with the rights of immigrants and immigrant labor. And let us go back a century to the Patterson Silk Strike, one of the major strikes in United States history, from February to July of 1913. 25,000 mostly immigrant workers walked out, shutting down 300 mills in Patterson, New Jersey, led by organizers from the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW. More than 3,000 people were arrested. Ultimately, the strike was lost, but the key demand would change the face of American labor. These crazy radicals wanted an eight-hour day. And now we've got it. This uh, cycle of, of five sonnets does take its title from Walt Whitman, Section 18, Song of Myself. So <clears throat> this again is called Vivas to Those Who Have Failed. Epigraph. Vivas to those who have failed and to those whose war vessels sank in the sea and to those themselves who sank in the sea, and to all generals that lost engagements, and all overcome heroes, and the numberless unknown heroes equal to the greatest heroes known. Walt Whitman. One, the red flag. The newspapers said the strikers would hoist the red flag of anarchy over the silk mills of Patterson. At the strike meeting, a dyer's helper from Naples rose, as if from the steam of his labor, lifted up his hand and said, Here is the red flag, brightly stained with dye for the silk of bow ties and scarves, the skin and fingernails boiled away for six dollars a week in the dye house. He sat down without another word, sank back into the fumes, name and face rubbed off by oblivion's thumb, like a Roman coin from the earth of his birthplace dug up after a thousand years, as the strikers shouted the only praise he would ever hear. 2. The river floods the avenue. He was the other Valentino, not the romantic chic and bullfighter of silent movie palaces who died too young, but the Valentino standing on his stoop to watch detectives hired by the company bully strike breakers onto a trolley and a chorus of strikers bellowing the band word scab. He was not a striker or a scab, but the bullet fired to scatter the crowd pulled the cork in the wine barrel of Valentino's back. His body pale as the wings of a moth, lay beside his big-bellied wife. Two 
white-veiled horses pulled the carriage to the cemetery. Twenty thousand strikers walked behind the hearse, flooding the avenue like the river that lit up the mills, surging around the tombstones. Blood for blood, cried Tresca. At his signal, thousands of hands dropped red carnations and ribbons into the grave till the coffin evaporated in a red sea. Three, the insects in the soup. Reed was a Harvard man. He wrote for the New York magazines. Big Bill, the organizer, fixed his one good eye on Reed and told him of the strike. He stood on a tenement porch across from the mill to escape the rain and listen to the weavers. The blue coats told him to move on. The Harvard man asked for a name to go with the number on the badge, and the cops tried to unscrew his arms from their sockets. When the judge asked his business, Reed said, Poet. The judge said, Twenty days in the county jail. Reed was a Harvard man. He taught the strikers Harvard songs, the tunes to sing with rebel words at the gates of the mill. The strikers taught him how to spot the insects in the soup, speaking in tongues the gospel of one big union and the eight-hour day, cramming the jail till the weary jailers had to unlock the doors. Reed would write, there's war in Patterson. After it was over, he rode with Pancho Villa. Four, the little agitator. The cops on horseback charged into the picket line. The weavers raised their hands across their faces, hands that knew the loom as their father's hands knew the loom, and the billy clubs broke their fingers. Hannah was seventeen, the captain of the picket line, the Joan of Arc of the silk strike. The prosecutor called her a little agitator. Shame, said the judge. If she picketed again, he would ship her to the state home for girls in Trenton. Hannah left the courthouse to picket the mill. She chased a strike breaker down the street, yelling in Yiddish the word for shame. Back in court, she hissed at the judge's sentence of another striker. Hannah got twenty days in jail for hissing. She sang all the way to jail. After the strike came the blacklist, the counter at her husband's candy store. The words for shame. Five. Vivas to those who have failed. Strikers without shoes lose strikes. Twenty years after the weavers and dyers' helpers returned hollow-eyed to the loom and the steam, Mazziati led the other silk mill workers marching down the avenue in Patterson, singing the old union songs of five cents more an hour. Once again, the night sticks cracked cheekbones like teacups. Mazziati pressed both hands to his head, squeezing red ribbons from his scalp. There would be no buffalo nickel for an hour's work at the mill for the silk of bow ties and scarves. Skull remembered wood. The brain thrown against the wall, the skull remembered too. The sons of Italy, the workmen's circle, local 152, industrial workers of the world, one-eyed Big Bill and Flynn, the rebel girl, speaking in tongues the thousands, the prophecy of an eight-hour day. Mazziati's son would become a doctor, his daughter a poet. Vivas to those who have failed, for they become the river. So, a century later, now comes Donald Trump. <laughs> Republican candidate for president, bellowing sock puppet for bigots everywhere, trying to ride a wave of anti-immigrant demagoguery all the way to the White House. And this tradition is also nothing new. When I think of demagoguery, I think of George Wallace. 
former governor of Alabama, and there is more than a bit of George Wallace and Donald Trump. When Trump announced his candidacy in June of 2015 and slandered Mexican immigrants, and famously said, quote, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, his campaign took off, and here we are. The perception of dangerousness is itself dangerous. Two months after Trump announced his candidacy, according to the Boston Globe, two South Boston brothers, Scott and Steve Leader, came across a homeless Mexican man on their way back from a Red Sox game, woke him up by urinating in his face, and then beat him severely, breaking his nose. Scott Leader was then quoted as saying, Donald Trump is right, all these illegals need to be deported. When uh, Trump, parenthetically, was contacted with the news, he responded that his supporters are passionate. Trump wants to build a wall, of course, along the border that would really be a monument to himself, like the statues of conquerors we see all over the landscape. This next poem is about two such statues of a man by the name of Juan de Oñate, the Spanish conquistador who conquered what is today called New Mexico. But it's about resistance too, on the part of indigenous people, who, after all, are the ones crossing the border. The idea, as immigrant rights activists put it, that we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. So, <coughs> here we are on the border, and a poem called The Right Foot of Juan de Oñate for John Nichols and Arturo Madrid. On the road to Taos, in the town of Alcalde, the bronze statue of Juan de Oñate, the conquistador, kept vigil from his horse. Late one night, a chainsaw sliced off his right foot, stuttering to the ball of his ankle as Oñate's spirit scratched and howled like a dog trapped within the bronze body. Four centuries ago, after his cannon fire burst to burn hundreds of bodies and blacken the adobe walls of the Acoma Pueblo, Oñate wheeled on his startled horse and spoke the decree. All Acoma males above the age of 25 would be punished by amputation of the right foot. Spanish knives sawed through ankles. Spanish hands tossed feet into piles like fish at the marketplace. There was prayer and wailing in a language Oñate did not speak. Now, at the airport in El Paso, across the river from Juarez, Another bronze statue of Oñate rises on a horse frozen in fury. The city fathers smash champagne bottles across the horse's legs to christen the statue, and Oñate's spirit remembers the chainsaw carving the ball of his ankle. The Acoma Pueblo still stands. Thousands of brown feet walk across the border, the desert of Chihuahua, the shallow places of the Rio Grande, the bridges from Juarez to El Paso. Oñate keeps watch, high on horseback above the Rio Grande, the law of the conquistador rolled in his hand, helpless as a man with an amputated foot, spirit scratching and howling like a dog within the bronze body. So that poem is for Donald Trump. <laughs> the perception of dangerousness is itself dangerous. Young African American males are nine times more likely to be killed by police in this country. The Guardian study shows that in 2015, 1,145 people in the United States were killed by police. 304 African-American, 
292 male, 195 Latinos, 191 male. This indeed is the poem that opens Policing the Planet, edited by Jordan Camp and Christina Heatherton and available uh, from Verso Books. Just went into a second printing and I urge you to pick it up. I told myself I could not write this poem, killing after killing after killing. And then I saw the Walter Scott video. And I had to write it. This poem refers to Scott, to Eric Garner, to Michael Brown, uh, to those whose names we know and those whose names we don't know. Going back 40 years to a Puerto Rican musician and photographer by the name of Martin Tito Perez, a friend of my father's, who was arrested for drumming on the subway and subsequently died at the hands of police in East Harlem. So, not only are the victims of police violence demonized as dangerous, so are the protesters. So is Black Lives Matter, and thus the last stanza of this poem, um, which Jordan alluded to. It is called, How We Could Have Lived or Died This Way, and again, there's an epigraph. Not songs of loyalty alone are these, but songs of insurrection also. For I am the sworn poet of every dauntless rebel the world over. Walt Whitman. I see the dark-skinned bodies falling in the street as their ancestors fell before the whip and steel, the last blood pooling, the last breath spitting. I see the immigrant street vendor flashing his wallet to the cops, shot so many times there are bullet holes in the soles of his feet. I see the deaf wood carver and his pocket knife crossing the street in front of a cop who yells, then fires. I see the drug raid at the wrong door kicked in the minister's heart seizing up. I see the man hawking a fist full of cigarettes, the cop's choke hold that makes his wheezing lungs stop wheezing forever. I am in the crowd at the window, kneeling beside the body left on the asphalt for hours, covered in a sheet. I see the suicides. The conga player, handcuffed for drumming on the subway, hanged in the jail cell with his hands cuffed behind him. The suspect, leaking blood from his chest in the back seat of the squad car. The 300-pound boy said to stampede, barehanded, into the bullets drilling his forehead. I see the coroner nodding. The words he types in his report burrowing into the skin like more bullets. I see the government investigation stacking words buzzing on the page, then suffocated as bees suffocate in a jar. I see the next black man fleeing as the fugitive slave once fled the slave catcher shot in the back for a broken tail light. I see the cop handcuff the corpse. I see the rebels marching, hands upraised before the riot squads, faces in bandanas against the tear gas, and I walk beside them unseen. I see the poets who will write the songs of insurrection, generations unborn will read or hear a century from now, words that make them wonder how we could have lived or died this way, how the descendants of slaves still fled and the descendants of slave catchers still shot them, how we awoke every morning without the blood of the dead sweating from every pore. I also want to touch upon what's happening right now on the island of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, of course, has been in the headlines. You're aware of a $72 billion debt. You're aware of a financial control board that's been imposed on the island, on the government, the economy, and the people there. Um, you may be aware that this is yet another manifestation of colonialism. You may not be aware that there is and has been an independence movement 
in Puerto Rico against the presence of the United States and before that against the presence of Spain. It's the oldest colony in the world, four centuries under Spain and now more than a century under the United States. My father was born there. And I can tell you that there is a difference between the flag of the colonizer and the flag of the colonized. I can tell you that there is a yearning for liberation from colonialism woven into the very history of the Puerto Rican flag. That yearning may help to explain why, across the political spectrum of Puerto Rico and in the Puerto Rican community on the mainland, there is support for the release of a man by the name of Oscar Lopez Rivera, who has served 35 years in prison, convicted of seditious conspiracy against the United States. I wrote uh, the foreword for Cartas a Karina, or Letters to Karina, Oscar's forthcoming book, composed of letters he has written to his granddaughter while incarcerated. This is part of his campaign for a pardon from President Obama. This poem begins the foreword. And it's about the origins of the Puerto Rican flag. And it's also about that yearning for liberation and something more. It's a, a poem called Flowers and Bullets. And once again, there's an epigraph. Cuba and Puerto Rico are two wings of the same bird. They receive flowers and bullets in the same heart. Lola Rodriguez de Tio. Tattoo the Puerto Rican flag on my shoulder. Stain the skin red, white, and blue. Not the colors that snap over holiday parades or sag over the graves of <coughs> veterans in the States, but the colors of Cuba reversed. A flag for the rebels in the hills of Puerto Rico dreamt up by Puerto Rican exiles in the Cuban Revolutionary Party bearded and bespectacled in the sleet of New York, wise men lost on their way to Bethlehem. That was 1895, the same year Jose Marti would die, poet shot from a white horse in his first battle. Tattoo the Puerto Rican flag on my shoulder, so if I close my eyes forever in the cold and the doctors cannot tell the cause of death, you will know that I died like Jose Marti, with flowers and bullets in my heart. This next poem is about going back to Puerto Rico. My father, going back for the first time in many, many years. And me, born in Brooklyn, going for the first time at the age of 11. I wrote this poem after my father, Frank Espada, died two years ago in 2014. And um, I was sorting through his things. This is a familiar ceremony to anyone who has ever lost a parent going through the stuff. And it was mostly junk, right? But then I found the treasure. In this case, Super 8 film, a silent movie of our encounter with Puerto Rico <coughs> and ourselves. Uh, there's a little bit of Spanish in this poem. Uh, I refer to Noche Buena, which is Christmas Eve. And I use a, a word, uh, bendito. Uh, it, it's sort of an all-purpose Puerto Rican word. Literally means blessed, but it can mean anything to something very good to something very bad. This poem is called Haunt Me, and it's for my father. I am the archaeologist. I sift the shards of you. Cufflinks. Passport photos, a button from the March on Washington with a black hand shaking a white hand, letters in Spanish, your birth certificate from a town high in the mountains. I cup your silence, and the silence melts like ice in a cup. 
I search for you in two yellow Kodak boxes marked Puerto Rico Nochebuena, December 1968. In the eight millimeter silence, the espadas gather, elders born before the Spanish-American War, my grandfather on crutches after fracturing his fossil hip, his blind brother on a king. You greet the elders and they call you Tato, the name they call you there. Uncles and cousins sing in a chorus of tongues without sound, vibration of guitar strings stilled by an unseen hand, maraca shaking empty of seats. The camera wobbles from the singers to the television and the astronauts sending pictures of the moon back to Earth. Down by the river, women still pound laundry on the rocks. I I'm 11 again, a boy from the faraway city of ice that filled my grandfather, startled after the blind man with the cane stroked my face with his hand dry as straw, crying out, Bendito. At the table, I hear only the silence that rises like the river in my big ears. You sit next to me, clowning for the camera, tugging the lapels on your jacket, slicking back your black hair, brown skin, darker from days in the sun. You slide your arm around my shoulder, your good right arm, your pitching arm, and my moon face radiates, and the mountain song of my uncles and cousins plays in my head. Watching you, now, my face stings as it stung when my blind great uncle brushed my cheekbone searching for his own face. When you died, Tato, I took a razor to the movie looping in my head, cutting the scenes where you curled an arm around my shoulder, all the times you would squeeze the silence out of me so I could hear the cries and songs again. When you died, I heard only the silences between us, the shouts belling the air before the phone went dead, all the words melting like ice in a cup. That way I could set my jaw and take my mother's hand at the mortuary, greet the elders in my suit and tie at the memorial, say all the right words. Yet my face stings at last. I rewind and watch your arm drape across my shoulder over and over. A year ago, you pressed a Kodak slide of my grandfather into my hand and said, next time, stay longer. Now, in the silence that is never silent, I push the chair away from the table and say to you, sit down. Tell me everything. Haunt me. I think there might be some uh, some room in the back. Is she standing? There's maybe some room in the back over there. I'm going to read two more uh, poems. This, uh, this next poem is not only about racism, it's about resistance to racism through art. It's about making the invisible visible. It's about resistance to erasure. My father, Frank Espada, was a documentary photographer, among other things. He wanted to photograph his Puerto Rican community, an invisible community erased by the legacies of racism and colonialism. A famous photographer, Cornell Kappa, told him, no one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. My father took this as a challenge. He used to repeat it to me over and over again. You know what Cornell Kappa said to me? <laughs> no. What did he say? No one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. 
Well, my father created something called the Puerto Rican Diaspora Documentary Project, a photo documentary and oral history of the Puerto Rican migration. His photographs are now in the collections of the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. He made the invisible visible, which poets and artists and activists ought to do. Uh, the title of this poem comes from a classic 1934 horror movie with Peter Lorre. I urge you to see it if you can. It is very strange. <laughs> poem is called Mad Love. And as you might suspect, it is an epigraph. No one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Cornell Capo. My brother said they harvested his corneas. I imagined the tweezers lifting the corneas from my father's eyes, delicate as the wings of butterflies mounted under glass. I imagined the transplant stitches finer than hair, eyes fluttering awake to the brilliance of an open window. This is not a horror movie. This is not Peter Lorre in Mad Love, the insane and jealous surgeon grafting the hands of a killer onto the forearms of a concert pianist who fumbles with the keys of the piano, flings knives with lethal aim, moonlight sonata swept away by lust for homicide, his wife shrieking. The blind will see like the captain of the slave ship who turned the ship around. Voices in the room will praise the Lord for the miracle. Yet the eyes drinking light through my father's eyes will not see the faces in the lens of his camera, faces of the faceless waking in the dark room. Not the tomato picker with a picket sign on his shoulder that says Reagan steals from the poor and gives to the rich. Not the fry cook in his fedora, staring at air as if he knew he would be stomped to death on the stoop for an empty wallet. Not the poet in a beret, grinning at the vision of shoes for all the shoeless people on the earth. Not the dancer hearing the piano tell her to spin and spin again. Not the grave digger in his machete, the bandana that keeps the dust of the dead from coating his tongue. Not the union organizer's spirits floating in the smoke of his victory cigar. Not the addict in rehab gazing at herself like a fortune teller gazing at the cards. Not the face half hidden by the star and the Puerto Rican flag, the darkness of his dissident's eye. Now that my father cannot speak, they wait their turn to testify in his defense witnesses to the mad love that drove him to it. <laughs> well, Frank Espada was a community organizer. He was a civil rights activist. And he was a leader, some would say the leader, of the Puerto Rican community in New York City in the 1960s and early 70s. That's a community of almost one million people. He was radicalized by being arrested in Mississippi in 1949 for not going to the back of the bus. He even spoke at a rally with Malcolm X and then took his photograph. How do you summarize that life? How do you summarize such a big life? Well, I hit upon a metaphor. It brings me to a little plant called the Moribibi. Moribibi literally translates from the Puerto Rican Spanish as I died, I lived. Moribibi, I died, I lived. It's uh, the word, the Puerto Rican word for the mimosa pudica. Uh, it's a plant that closes to the touch and then opens again. 
closes to the darkness and then opens again. And so this became my metaphor. Metaphor for the many lives, the many escapes, the many deaths, the many rebirths of Francisco Luis Espada. And indeed, I get the strong feeling he is here right now. I read this poem in his memorial service in Brooklyn at uh, a community center called El Puente in May of 2014. So I'll close with this um, poem and then take your questions. El Mori Vivi, in memoriam, Frank Espada, 1930 to 2014. The Spanish means, I died, I lived. In Puerto Rico, the leaves of El Mori Vivi close in the dark and open at first light. The fronds curl at a finger's touch and then unfurl again. My father, a mountain born of mountains, the tallest Puerto Rican in New York who scraped doorways, who could crack the walls with the rumble of his voice, kept a Mori Vivi growing in his ribs. He would die, then live. My father spoke in the tongue of El Mori Vivi, teaching me the parable of Joe Fleming, who screwed his lit cigarette into the arms of the spicks he caught flapping like fish. My father was a bony boy, the nerves in his back crushed by the Aiello Coal and Ice Company, the load he lifted up too many flights of stairs. Three times they would meet to brawl for a crowd at the school. The first time my father opened his eyes to gravel and the shoes of his enemy. The second time he rose and dug his arm up to the elbow in the monster's belly. So badly did he want to tear out the heart and eat it. The third time Fleming did not show up. And the boys with cigarette burns clapped their spindly champion on the back all the way down the street. Fleming would become a cop, fired for breaking bones in too many faces. He died smoking in bed, a sheet of flame up to his chin. There was a Morty Vivi sprouting in my father's chest. He would die, then live. He spat obscenities like sunflower seeds at the driver who told him to sit at the back of the bus in Mississippi, then slipped his cap over his eyes and fell asleep. He spent a week in jail, called it the best week of his life, strolled to the jailhouse door and sat behind the driver of the bus on the way out of town, his Air Force uniform, all that kept the noose from his neck. He would come to know the jailhouse again among hundreds of demonstrators ferried by police to Hart Island on the East River where the city of New York stacks the coffins of anonymous and stillborn bodies. Here, Confederate prisoners once wept for the stars and bars. Now, the prisoners sang freedom songs. The jailers outlawed phone calls, so we were sure my father must be a body like the bodies rolling water logged in the East River till he came back from the island of the dead, black hair combed meticulously. When the riots burned in Brooklyn night after night, my father was a peacemaker on the corner with a megaphone. A fiery chunk of concrete fell from the sky and missed his head by inches. My mother would tell me, your father is out dodging bullets. He spoke at a rally with Malcolm X, incantatory words billowing through the bundled crowd, lifting hands and faces. Teach, they cried. My father clicked a photograph of Malcolm as he bent to hear a question, finger pressed against the chin. Two months later, the assassins stampeded the crowd to shoot Malcolm, blood leaping from his chest as he fell. My father would die too, but then he would live again. After every riot, every rally, every arrest, 
Every night in jail, the change from his pockets landing hard on the dresser at 4 a.m. every time I swore he was gone for good. My father knew the secrets of El Moribibi, that he would die then live. He drifted off at the wheel, drove into a guardrail, shook his head, and walked away without a web of scars or fractures. He passed out from the heat in the subway, toppled onto the tracks, and somehow missed the third rail. He tied a white apron across his waist to open a grocery store, pulled a revolver from the counter to startle the gangsters demanding protection, then put up signs for a clearance sale as soon as they backed out the door with their hands in the air. When the family finally took a vacation in the mountains of the Hudson Valley, a hotel with waiters in white jackets and white paint peeling in the room, the roof exploded in flame as if the ghost of Joe Fleming and his cigarette trailed us everywhere. And it was then that my father appeared in the smoke like a general leading the charge in battle, shouting commands at the volunteer fire company, steering the water from the hoses, since he was immune to death by fire or water, as if he wore the crumbled leaves of El Moribibi in an amulet slung around his neck. My brother called to say El Moribibi was gone. My father tore at the wires, the electrodes, the IV, saying that he wanted to go home. The hospital was a jailhouse in Mississippi. The furious pulse that fired his heart in every fight flooded the chambers of his heart. The doctors scrutinized the film, the grainy shadows and the light, but could never see. My father was a Moribibi. I died. I lived. He died. He lived. He dies. He lives. Which I guess is